You can go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the Broader Impacts Conference uh, Career Awards panel. I'm Shobha Ramanand, and I'm joined uh, with my colleagues, Lori Ernie Flesner and Mary Ann Walker. We all are grant writers on staff in, in the Office of the Vice President of Research and Innovation. Um, we're joined today by four distinguished colleagues um, who are um, Angela Wilson, Rebecca Anthony, Michaela um, Tur Avest, and Alexa Wienema. Um, Dr. Wilson is the John Hanna Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and the Associate Dean of Strategic Initiatives in the College of Natsai and was the former director for the Division of Chemistry at the National Science Foundation. Three faculty members, uh, Rebecca Anthony, Michaela Taravis, and Alexa Wienema, all have won career awards from NSF, who will share their uh, insights into writing successful career proposals. Um, I'll be asking uh, uh, the first question to start off the uh, panel. And from then on, my colleague uh, Lauren uh, will take over. Um, one of the questions we would like to ask the, all the panelists is that, will each of you uh, kindly tell us about your research topic of your career proposals? And this question also goes specifically to Dr. Wilson. Uh, based on your experience at the National Science Foundation, could you please uh, tell us um, the importance of broader impacts on career proposals. And I just want to remind uh, all the audience that uh, uh, this session is being recorded and closed captioned and will be available on uh, the VPRI website and the University Outreach and Engagement website and the conference website. And um, we also request that after the panel discussions, which will last about 40 minutes. There is a Q&A feature, and if you have any questions, to please type in uh, your questions in the Q&A feature of this presentation. Thank you. So I would like to open up to the panelists about what was the research topic of the career proposals, then ask Dr. Wilson to give her insights on the importance of BI uh, two career proposals after that. Thank you. So would any one of you like to go uh, first? Michaela or... Hi, Rebecca. Okay. Hi. Thank you very much, Soba. Um, so my name is Rebecca Anthony. I'm Associate Professor in the Mechanical Engineering Department in the College of Engineering. And I wrote my career proposal on synthesis of non-isotropic or anisotropic silicon nano, nanomaterials or nanocrystals using plasma reactors. And so it's purely experimental work. Um, we, I, my broader impacts component centered on um, <clears throat> performing sort of research related outreach to female students in the K-12 um, sort of age range uh, in, in like in trying to inspire them to pursue their interests in science, technology, engineering, and math careers or, or uh, their engagement in those topics going forward. Okay, I can go next. I'm Michaela Taravis. I'm an assistant professor in the biochemistry and molecular biology department. And my career proposal focused on engineering bacteria to fix carbon dioxide and convert it into useful fuels and bioproducts using electricity as the energy source for that process. Um, so it's kind of like simultaneously fixing carbon dioxide, storing electrical energy and producing useful products. The educational component of my proposal focused on developing a team at MSU for the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, or IGEM. 
And iGEM is an international synthetic biology competition, mostly for undergraduates, um, that also involves both research for the undergraduates and they are supposed to do outreach in the synthetic biology world. So that also contained sort of a nested broader impact activity that those students that we were training also do outreach to the public. Good, um, I can go next. I'm Alexa Finema. I'm an associate professor in the psychology department. And my research is more in the field of behavioral neuroscience. So I'm using animal models to study how the brain uh, regulates social behavior. And my NSF career award was about um, more specifically juvenile social behaviors as um, there is a lot of emphasis on adult social behaviors and much less so on juvenile social behaviors. And uh, my research indicated that um, I, I'm, I'm really intrigued how the brain coordinates different behaviors, especially at this very young age. Um, and my education or broader impact components uh, were a variety of components, but I kind of want to share my screen with you to talk uh, a little bit about one of them. Um, let me see if this works. And that is that I initiate uh, uh, this bring your family to the lab day. Um, I think that, um, well, for I think for all the three panelists, it's true that it's really difficult for the, the audience or the, for the public to understand what we are doing and to kind of bring it a little bit closer to them. I thought that maybe turning it upside down. So instead of uh, bring your uh, child to work day to do it the other way around. Um, and I think that especially for a lot of parents, it's intriguing what their children are doing, even if they don't understand exactly what their children are doing. And so to kind of bring them into the laboratory, um, have them um, being able to kind of um, do certain procedures that also their children have been taught um, uh, over the, the period that they were in the lab. Um, I think that that was really a very valuable experience. And as you can see here, we even had a professional photographer uh, from um, the university being involved, taking pictures. Therefore, these pictures are so cool. Um, but all the students and under, especially undergraduate students and also graduate students were involved in teaching their parents what they were doing. So this was, I think, um, one of the, the aspects that review is really picked up as being something unique and important, even though maybe the educational part is really small because it's only the families. Uh, but of course, they probably bring that home, talk to their friends, etc. So uh, this was kind of an initiative that I think that maybe anyone can incorporate in their uh, broader impacts because it is not necessarily uh, research specific, but this is kind of more in general um, engaging the family of your uh, lab members in the research that, that you are doing. So I will stop share this and uh, that was my part for now. So for me, I also am a career already and uh, mine was a number of years ago. Um, my area is theoretical uh, physical chemistry. And so I had worked on some development of new theoretical methods, uh, understanding of existing methods and then uh, applying them to some work in atmospheric chemistry. In addition to that, um, uh, you know, nowadays it doesn't seem like it's such an odd thing to have a virtual class, but I provided the first 100% online <laughs> computational chemistry class long ago. I guess I was a woman before my time, I guess. Um, but, you know, part of the reason for that was because NSF often, even though they say you can do course development, they're not so much into the course development generally for funding for the broader impacts education. So be real careful about that. Um, and uh, so, but for me, the reason for doing it was not to teach the students at the university. It was to reach out to people who are working in rural areas, working in companies, and really would like to do some additional training to learn more about computational uh, and how to apply that, the computational aspects within chemistry. And so that's why it was kind of a part of my broader impact piece. One of the things I was going to say, because the other part of my question was, you know, since I, I led the division of chemistry, and during that time I saw a lot of career proposals, and I've been on many career panels through the years. Um, so a question that was asked of me was basically, uh, please talk about the importance of broader impacts in career proposals. 
That career education piece is absolutely vital. I mean, the broader impacts piece is always a very important part in any NSF proposal, but for the career proposal, that additional educational component, it's as important as the research component. Um, it has to be, it has to be a component that includes some literature, some relevance, that's very important to kind of build up the case for the rationale of needing that educational component. Um, so that's really important to include. Normally broader impacts is a piece that if it's not included in the NSF proposal, it will not be funded. And also there's an awful lot of very good proposals that come into NSF. Um, a lot of good, great career, career proposals, but also really great proposals in general. And what happens is the broader impacts is really the tiebreaker. It is the piece that will push this whole pool of good proposals up to these are the proposals we're going to fund. So you want to make sure that you really kind of blow your audience away in terms of the broader impacts. And you can see, it, it, you know, from the examples that have been given, they are projects that don't take up your entire career because you're researchers, but they're ones that do make a difference. And it can be, you know, a, a smaller group of people, which very innovative idea. I just love what you did, Alexa, um, to, you know, uh, having a, a, a broader range. But I think what it's, what's really important is to identify something that you're going to be passionate about and something that is going to be uh, something that you are going to like doing for a number of years. I think a lot of career proposals fail because often people say, hey, my research group will do this. And the investigator is not also involved. It's really important to do a project that you're gonna be a part of as well. Um, I can expand on more after, as we go through more questions, but in general, the broader impacts piece is very important. Don't let it frighten you, have fun with it. Um, you know, certainly tie it to your research in some way. It can be very directly tied or more loosely tied, like uh, Alexa's example, bringing people in to see the lab, see what they're doing. I love it, Alexa. <laughs> That's a great example. So thank you. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for sharing um, what your career proposals were about. And thank you, Angela, um, for sharing your wisdom from NSF. My next question is, how did each of you integrate broadening participation and broader impacts with your projects, research, and education activities? And what advice would you like to share with our audience about that? Who would like to go first? Rebecca, would you like to go first? Hi. Um, I think it's a good question and important to consider. So I was not only awarded my career proposal, but I've also served on a career panel for NSF and for the same program that awarded my award. And so I think that's useful because I can bring not only what I did personally, but also I can share sort of what happened during that panel. Um, <clears throat> so for me personally, the main key was to try to identify like what is the main, so again, let me go back and revisit the, the broader impacts that I did propose and, and my educational component had to do with trying to inspire particularly female, um, but all students in the K-12 um, age range to pursue their interest in engineering and science and other careers like that. And so um, when I wrote, I did include literature. And so I did some, a little bit of research. I wouldn't say it was a lot of research. I would maybe an hour or two on Google Scholar, just trying to find some citations that backed up some activities. And so my activities, the, the, the literature that I cited in that section of my proposal included literature on where are the big gaps for in training females into science, technology, engineering, and math careers. And then also what are some ways that cause new knowledge to sort of stick. When I say stick, I mean, stay with the students after the event. And so the, the third piece was trying to tie that into my research as, as a whole. And so what I had to do is kind of pick up on what is the kind of thing that I want my, the audience of my outreach events to remember? And like, how can I tie that into a hands-on like physical activity that they can enjoy? And so that those elements coupled with the sort of trying to use some some published literature to back up my statements, I think was important. That's what I did when I was writing my proposal. But then when I was on the career panel, there was some um, 
like I would say there was a lot of discussion about how not just how is this outreach event I guess what I would say is the research that you're proposing has to actually directly tie to the outreach event in terms of the way that the panel was evaluating the proposals. It can't just be, I'm having this research over here and then also I'm gonna do, I'm gonna participate in, you know, in something totally unrelated. There had to be some like educational tie back that talked about the results that you're gaining in the research that you're doing and that you're proposing to do and how those results can be linked to the educational or broader impacts component. And so there were some criticisms of proposals where there was not such a strong connection. The, the two events, the research and the educational component seemed really disparate or not linked at all. And that was a criticism that was um, a constructive criticism that was uh, recorded for the, for the proposers. And so I think that like, it doesn't take that much. Like it's not, I don't think you should be spending too much of your energy thinking about the ways that that can happen, but it does mean that you need to directly reference in that section of your proposal, you need to directly reference the particular outcomes of your research that will be included in the broader impacts section. So that's my perspective. I don't know if, if Alexa and um, Michaela and anybody else wants to log in. Yeah, I can kind of pick up there because I think um... I had a really convenient system to make that work really well in my proposal. Um, so because the iGEM team does research and it's synthetic biology research and my proposed project is also synthetic biology research, there is a ton of crosstalk and back and forth. And I think I was able to put in my proposal a piece of preliminary data for that related to the research project I was doing, but it was actually generated by the iGEM team. And that worked out really well because they one year had done a project that was closely related to the actual research in my lab. But I could also make the case that, you know, they choose a different project every year. Sometimes it's closely related to my work, sometimes it's not. But even when it's not that closely related in terms of the actual scientific topic, the teams are often kind of working at the leading edge of synthetic biology techniques. So I could still make the argument that they're bringing higher risk, newer cutting edge techniques into my lab in this sort of like low risk setting where like they're not PhD students who need to graduate. They are undergrads who are you know, kind of testing their limits of what they can do. And if they, if they don't get results, you know, there aren't really any consequences for them. So my research benefits a lot from having some people around who are doing that kind of high risk, high reward research. And then they also benefit from, you know, we've put together a team of mentors. I'm not the only mentor and they benefit from just all of our knowledge about synthetic biology and giving them the option to do all kinds of different projects. So I really agree with what Rebecca said. And I've also been on a career panel and saw the same thing that, um, you know, even great activities, if they didn't seem that well linked to the actual research that was seen as a downside. Um, so I guess like, my advice part of that would be like, really think about the, um, try to pick something for your educational component from the beginning that makes it convenient to have a lot of crosstalk back and forth with your research rather than trying to shoehorn it because I think it's really obvious later when it was like, oh, we wanted to develop these activities for K through 12 kids. And then you realize that your research is really much too complex for the audience that you picked. And then you're just trying to like, you know, dumb down a nano crystal for a third grader. And it's just, you know, it's not working that much. Um, I'm not, uh, I, I assume Rebecca, since you were successful that like you did that in a good way, but I think um, it's not always successful. Um, and then in terms of the broadening participation part, um, what we did was pretty, like limited in scope, I would say, but the key activity that we had 
for broadening participation is that at for MSU for our iGEM team, we've committed to um, funding all the students who are on the team with a stipend. So they get paid a similar stipend as what they would get in an NSF REU, but our program is less competitive than getting into an NSF REU. So it's an opportunity for students at MSU who are, you know, one third of our students are first generation college students. A lot of them have to work in the summer. Um, it gives them an opportunity to financially be able to start on the research path. Um, you know, I had previously worked with iGEM teams at Cornell and Berkeley, and those students were not getting paid. And, you know, I could really see the disparity in terms of like who was able to participate and who wasn't able to participate. So while that's kind of a small thing, that was that was kind of like what I proposed as as you know, enabling a broader range of people to participate. Good, yeah, I think that uh, Rebecca and Michaela already gave great examples of that it really needs to relate to your research. I think that that is really essential to, to um, incorporate in your uh, grant proposal. And sometimes that can be really challenging depending on the area of research that you are in. And for me, I find it really challenging because uh, using animal models that might be something that not everyone is very um, passionate about or may even um, support. And so I, I did want to have um, elements in there to kind of um, um, educate the public in, in, in a good way. So I had uh, just an annual lecture that I wanted to give to the public. And I also had some elements in there to, to bring in high school students um, into my lab over the summer. Uh, because I'm, I'm really passionate more about the one-on-one -on -one training. So it's a little bit of a smaller scale. It's not really very big, but uh, I think that that is also something that you really have to think about. What are you passionate about? And what do reviewers feel that, that this is really a genuine interest to you? Because of course you can kind of list a lot of activities that you aim to do, but it should be realistic and something that you can incorporate in your day-to-day -day work. Um, that is indeed is not making too much of an effort to you. Um, but yeah, it should also be something that um, it is still realistic to be accomplished. And um, I think it also might help if you already have some track record in broader impact in one way or another that you can play up that you say, okay, I have some of the um, the basics, the foundation already there, but now I want to improve it further on a, a larger scale or something like that, so that they really also understand that you are passionate about these educational components and, and broader impacts as well. Um, and maybe it will also be helpful to kind of see what is already available at MSU um, for uh, educational broader impact. So I'm actually currently also trying to submit an, a new NSF grant proposal. And again, there, there needs to be these broader impacts uh, components in there. And I really love that MSU has this MSU Science Festival. And there, uh, each researcher can propose to set up a booth. And something like that is maybe uh, a smaller part, but it, it is already, the framework is already there. So um, that can also be um, resonating well with the reviewers that this is something that is very reasonable, that this will be a successful um, um, incorporation in your broader impacts, and that could be lasting for many, many years to come. I'm really glad, Alexa, you mentioned uh, leveraging uh, resources already available. And uh, Michigan State University, in the next session, you'll be learning a lot about the existing resources. And um, it you know saves time and money to set it up. You know when we have the resources, leverage them so that you could you know um, make your proposal that much more competitive. And Angela might be able to answer a little of that. Um, yeah. So I was going to add add in a few more things here. So. Um, you know, I'm one who, you know, I'm not going to be educating the public about theoretical chemistry. And so, you know, basically I had kind of a multi-tiered uh, approach to the broader impacts and the education approach. So I already mentioned reaching out to more rural, you know, folks in rural communities, but also I just used the broad topic of chemistry and did some chemistry outreach. And so, you know, just making even kind of a broad link, broad leap like that is okay. 
I've seen someone, I mean, some of the best ones I've seen um, through the years, I saw someone who, um, you know, they were doing synthetic chemistry and there's no way you're going to get folks doing synthetic chemistry, you know, doing public outreach on that. But what they did was they turned it into food chemistry and they were, you know, they had something in the New York Times. I mean, they were some culinary column. I mean, all kinds of things sprung from this. It was just absolutely amazing. Um, you know, I, and I encourage everyone to take a look at the uh, NSF award database because you'll be able to see in your fields some of the different types of activities that people have pursued because there will be a statement about the broader impacts and the education component on each one of the career awards. And also with MSU, you have a lot of amazing things that are already set up that are pretty unique that you could really play into. And I'm just gonna give a few examples. You'll hear more this afternoon. One, we have the uh, Science on a Sphere at the, at the, uh, on campus in the museum. Science on a Sphere is something you can actually program all types of amazing things on. They have a team. You could actually pay a student not that much to get, become educated on that and make a show. Once you've made a show, it can be on an international network and, and do kind of outreach across the, across the globe in terms of your research. I've not seen anyone do that. That is a great, I think that would be an amazing outreach. Um, we have got MSU extension. We've got 650 extension something like that, that are in communities all across Michigan. So there's ways to work with them. They work with the schools across the, across the state. There's great ways to do outreach through them. In, in, um, in Detroit, we have a museum in Detroit. We have outreach programs in Detroit. I tell you what, we've got 95% of the students in the inter, you know, in the Detroit City Central that are on um, the food, uh, food, um, food programs. Um, low income, most of them are from underrepresented populations in science. That is an amazing place to do some outreach. And so these are just a few examples that, I mean, I think at MSU we're so lucky because we have so many things in place already. And I do really like uh, what was said that now is an opportunity that maybe if you haven't done any outreach yet, um, you, you really wanna be able to highlight that you've done some out, outreach. It helps in your proposal. If you've not done anything, these days and times, you could create something on Zoom, you could spend an afternoon doing it, and there you go, post it on YouTube and you've got step one, you've got a part of your, your outreach. And so I would suggest that you do something like that, a couple videos or something, just to kind of gear you up for this as well. Don't spend a lot of time on it, but do make nice ones. So just a few thoughts. Thank you so much. So my next question is, what advice do you have for faculty as they write about the educational activities in their proposal? Rebecca, would you like to start? I love the reputation I'm getting here. Um, <laughs> uh, highly anxious. Uh, so what I would like to say is that, um, like, I guess I, I, I'm a little curious about, can you expand a little bit on that, Lauren? Because in terms of content, we've kind of covered it, but what, what, what more, can you say a little bit more? Well, if you have any additional advice, because um, an, a, the educational component of the career proposal is something that is different from a lot of the NSF proposals that people submit. So if you have any additional advice for people to consider as they begin to write this component um, and could share that, that would be wonderful. Sure. Thanks, yeah. I. So one thing that has been brought up, but deserves underscoring is that this is not the typical NSF proposal where 14 pages are spent on the research and one page is spent on the broader impacts. You need to be thinking more along the lines of two to three pages for your broader impact segment. And that will include figures. And when I say figures, I you could include a mock-up of the, of the model year talking about maybe sharing with the public or your, you can include photographs of yourself or your lab members participating in past outreach events or a screenshot from the Zoom meeting that, that you just put together at, at Angela's suggestion, um, which is a great suggestion. I do think having a past track record is really helpful. Um, and so that, I, I don't think you should stress out about that. I mean, at this point it's March, the proposals are due in the summer. If you do some, something like what Angela said or try to get tied in, sometimes the science festival actually has, a, occasionally they have openings for additional events that you can participate in. 
um, that, you know, and that will be ongoing in the next month. So you could see if there's some, some way you can tie into that and, and don't spend a ton of time on it, maybe an afternoon or an evening if you have the freedom for that. Um, the other thing that I would say is that something that comes up fairly frequently is what are the ways that you're gonna evaluate the, for the impact of your um, event? And so you can do that by including the offering of a survey to the participants at the end, or you can, if you're tied into one of the existing MSU resources for a broader impacts and outreach, oftentimes they will have uh, evaluation metrics combined with the event. And so for example, I happen to know a little bit more about the Science Festival because I've been on the advisory board for the Science Festival for the MSU Science Festival for a number of years. Um, but they there are, are a lot of ways that they collect information about how participants to the MSU Science Festival have felt about the event. They also track numbers and so they they can tell how many members of the public visited the science festival during a particular day or week or during the festival as a whole. And so Tying in, so either either providing some kind of evaluation metric yourself and discussing that, spend a paragraph talking about that and how it will impact the, the outreach going forwards, or else discussing past metrics that have been recorded and implemented as per the MSU resources that you're gonna tap into. I think that's a good way that you can um, expand on the impact of what you're proposing to do. Hold on. I agree with everything Rebecca said completely. I think the having the track record and and the evaluation part is definitely key. Like in the um, panel that I went to, like that definitely was a major comment in a lot of proposals. And I think um, a survey is great, but some of them I think got dinged because they just said like, Oh, we'll do a survey, but they didn't really have goals ahead of time. Like, why are we doing the survey? What do we want to get out of it? And then tying that back to the literature that said, based on the literature, our goal was to achieve X and our survey was designed to really assess whether we achieved X and like having experts on board also who can help you design the survey. Um, if that's not your area is also seen really as a strength. Again, if you can ahead of time really make that connection and demonstrate that you have that connection. Um, I have a, my perspective, I have a little bit broader piece of advice just for the educational part, but for the whole proposal is like get as much feedback as possible before submitting it um, from anybody who will read it. <laughs> um, one of the most useful things that I did for mine was we set up in kind of my department and a couple closely related departments a peer mentoring group where we started about this time of year and met every week and just kind of shared our resources and things that we were learning. And then as we were writing, sharing drafts and you know talking about our plans and talking about our um, educational plans um, and just like being able to get that feedback was so helpful um, to say like, you know, something may sound really great in your head. And then when you talk about it to someone else, it may not seem as realistic. So I think that, um, yeah, that was super helpful. And I'll just say that like out of the group that I worked with half got it the first, half got it the first year we did that group. And then an additional two people got it the second year after resubmitting. So I think it was, that was like a very small experiment, but <laughs> it was pretty successful. So I definitely encourage everybody to just like try to get as much feedback on it as possible. Yeah, that, that this is all terrific advice. Uh, maybe I can add to that, that, um, the, the broader impact and also educational parts, they, they, what reviews really want to see is that it is beyond what you might already typically do uh, in a laboratory. So uh, for me, that would be um, mentoring and training undergraduate students. And so to say that you wanna do more of that, that is not really kind of what they are looking for. So it really also needs to be something original 
pref preferably. Uh, I think, especially when you are on a panel, when you are a reviewer, uh, those are the things that, that really also inspire me reading kind of, oh, wow, this is such a, a great initiative. And then you are already a little bit more kind of, you wanna, you wanna have that proposal being, uh, being funded in, in that way too. So I, I do remember that a colleague had an initiative with an animal zoo to set up uh, all kinds of things to um, get uh, students engaged into uh, social play with a, a very different animals, et cetera. And that was just such an original idea and it really tied into his research that was also on social play in, in different types of species. So I think that that originality is something that you want to play up that is kind of unique to you. Um, and that is something really that no one else might uh, think of. And that is really something that uh, researchers might think, uh, uh, reviewers might really like. Um, another aspect that I realized is that, of course, if you once you get funded, uh, you have to do an annual report. And uh, I, I was amazed that I had actually just too many elements in my education and broader impact uh, sections, and I could not accomplish them all. And that was fine. So that might also be something that you can think of that um, it, it is maybe anticipated that not all those components will work out, but of course, some of them should be uh, working out. So. Uh, I think it is important to make it as realistic as possible, but if you um, end up maybe not doing one, one of the components that you proposed, that might be okay. Um, I, could, I have a question for the panel regarding education. Uh, one of the goals of education is uh, plans are to develop workforce development. So if in the plan you can, um, um, you know, sort of indicate what type of new skills, et cetera, which might make the uh, students more competitive in the job market or, you know, to uh, in the research fields. Would that um, sort of tie in with both the education as well as the broader impacts? Can uh, the panel comment on that? Yes, that can certainly tie in, um, you know, but I, that needs to be just an aspect of, you know, I always suggest doing kind of a multi-tiered plan. Um, you know, you don't want to put propose too much um, because I've seen people propose too much and proposals get sunk because of that. Um, but multi-tiered uh, makes it, if it's a, a number of, of uh, different initiatives and one of them includes training of undergraduate students, you know, we, uh, most of us train some undergraduate students. So that just, it's just extra points that yes, indeed you're doing that. So you're satisfying workforce training. Um, there's other things we can do a, as well. Um, uh, and a couple of things I was just thinking about in terms of trying to get ready for this, you know, for folks who are getting ready for this ne next cycle. In addition to videos, another thing that you could possibly do is reach out to some of the high schools. I know some of the high school teachers are certainly getting Zoom fatigue. Some of them are back, but, you know, I'm sure many of them would welcome an opportunity to even reach out to um, the high school clubs, the high school teachers, and actually give uh, a short video talk on careers in, careers in your field. Um, that's, a, that's certainly an opportunity. Um, so so I, I do encourage, or reach out to Girl Scout troops, Boy Scout troops. I encourage folks to do something because I think that's a really important piece going forward. And also do mention if you've got honor students, if you've got students, Drew Scholar students, whatever in your lab, make sure you do mention that as part of uh, kind of what you're doing up to this stage and towards the workforce development as well. Um, one thing I wanted to mention in terms of evaluation, the evaluation component is important, but I think lots of times people think, oh my gosh, I've got to get experts to evaluate. You do not have to do that at all. Um, as long as, you know, but what's important is it's already been mentioned that you do have kind of what questions are going to be asked. You know, what is this, what is the purpose of the survey and providing a few more details than, hey, we're going to do a survey. Um, that's also really important. So this is kind of a random piece about the workforce development. Um, and I don't know, maybe Angela could provide more perspective on whether this actually matters at NSF or not. But uh, one place where I've found um, information that you can support the types of activities that you're doing is actually from congressional hearings. So, you know, there are congressional hearings like the Science and Technology 
committee about like what are the skills that we you know are leading or lagging in in the U.S. compared to education in other countries and I the reason that I bring this up is because synthetic biology specifically there have been a couple hearings in Congress about like are we lagging in the U.S. in training undergraduates in synthetic biology. The best thing to tie in there is the NSF 2030 report which talks a lot about workforce training. So anyone who's thinking about a career, I encourage you to take a look at that 2030 report and, and wrap that in. And, and there's a lot of insight in terms of things that need to be done in terms of workforce training. And also something to really think about, especially with all the focus now in DEIR is really, I mean, you know, to try to tie that in in various ways. It can be simple. I mean, one of the things I do to kind of continue with broader impact is, Every summer, except this past summer, I've tried to have a faculty member from an HBCU or HSI and support them to come do research in my lab. So there's just a series of simple things that we can do. But yeah, the congressional reports can certainly be cited. You know, I think most of our most of our areas have like a chemistry education journal, bio, you know, bi some sort of biology bi biology education journals. Those are good ones to go to. But also definitely look at this 2030 report by NSF. Thank you so much for those tips. At this time, we'd like to open up the floor to questions from the audience. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask our panelists, please go ahead and enter them into the Q&A feature of Zoom. We have uh, two questions already uh, for our panelists. Um, so the first question comes from Carter. And Carter asks, uh, people from privileged groups are often unaware of how their well-intentioned presence slash actions harm marginalized people. What should PIs who propose to do outreach with people from marginalized groups, e.g. white PIs and majority black schools, do to ensure that their, PI, their BIs do not do harm? Who would like to take that first? I, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that one. You know, the best thing to do on that is to really keep up with the literature. Um, you know, there, there are papers on this, on these types of topics. There's books on this topic. There's lots of websites on this. And, and my advice would be to just, you know, to be up on the, on, on, on the advice in, in that regard. Uh, others may have some other suggestions, but I mean, that's typically what I try to do, so. Yeah, and I would just say that this, that's like a really hard question. And I think one that I don't feel super, um, I don't think I'm doing a good enough job of that. But I think that's one place where building a diverse team and a diverse lab group with people of different perspectives is going to help with that because not that you're relying on somebody to like be the check on your behavior but that if you're as you're developing your activities you have a variety of different perspectives you're going to be less likely to unintentionally cause that harm because somebody who's in the conversation is going to be saying like hey you might not have thought of it this way but actually that could be harmful in this way so um, that's something that's really hard to do, but it's another motivation to, you know, build the team, build a diverse team from the beginning. Would anyone else like to address that question? I, I feel like one of the ways that might be helpful to attack, to try to address this quest, this problem or this, um, situation would be to really sort of turn your curiosity inwards and find out what, like, why are you proposing to work with a marginalized group? What do you really want to, like, make sure that you're going into it with uh, compassion and an understanding of why they may be marginalized and what are the problems that the group might be facing in terms of what you're trying to remedy. It's clearly if you're proposing to work with a marginalized group, then you identify that there is a problem being marginalized. And so I think it's useful to think about 
why that comes to you as a reason that you want to include that group in your broader impacts and, and really try to understand what are the problems that are being faced by that group in terms of their marginality. Um, I, I say this as a white lady, like, I don't know, I don't have a lot of, you know, I, I, I don't have a ton of intersections of diversity or intersections of underrepresentation, but I am underrepresented in my field. And um, and so like seeking to, to form some kind of a personal understanding of how that marginalization has occurred and how maybe has perpetuated over hundreds of years or maybe even longer, depending on what kind of marginalized group you're working with. And, and then making sure that as, as Michaela and Angela and others have said, um, try to find out from other people what what they think about what you're proposing to do and and whether whether other, other people whether they be part of that marginalized group or not may have a different track of education self-education in the topic area and may be able to say you know <laughs> this sounds good at the outset but what what are you really trying to do here you, you know you want to just make sure you're coming at this from a earnest and open-hearted place Any other responses to that question? <laughs> my, my own response sort of dovetails with what Michaela said, which is um, essentially think about co-creating the activity with your community partner, involve them in it. Um, so the next question is, uh, did the panelists use advisory boards for their career projects and how did they select the advisory board members and ask them to be on it? I did not, and I've reviewed hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of career proposals, and I've never seen one with an advisory board. I also did not have one and have not seen that, but I've only been on one panel, so not as much experience as Angel. Okay, here's a question specifically for Michaela, unless somebody else. Does somebody else want to respond to that question? No. Okay. I, I actually, I do want to respond to that question. Okay. I would like to seek some clarity from the person who asked the question on what they mean by advisory board, because I know that Michaela said that she was part of a group of people who were reviewing each other's career proposals. I definitely sought help from other people in reviewing my career proposal, but it wasn't in the form of something called an advisory board. It was more like a select group of individuals who I chose and who I chose with the help of my mentors and my department head to help me select that. And so is that is that the, the kind of answer that that individual is asking for? Like, I certainly had help. It wasn't organized help. It was more like this person in this area and this person who can review it from that standpoint and, and, and so, sort of like that. So that is 100% something I did. Um, so I don't know whether that addresses that question or not. I, I just am, I don't really know what the individual means by advisory board. Um, Elizabeth is raising her hand. Uh, Julie, can you un unmute Elizabeth? Hi, uh, thank you all for, for answering this question. Yeah, I um, submitted a career proposal last year and some of the feedback says, the use of a multidisciplinary advisory board could expand the reach of this project beyond communication and communication is my field. So I asked our NSF person, Sarah Steenrod, who works with MSU folks, and she also suggested doing it. So I'm really shocked to hear that none of them have ever, that you've seen Angela have ever uh, used this. So um, I'm a little confused now. Well, so a couple things. So every single division and even programs within divisions are different within NSF. And like, you know, I said earlier, you know, some divisions like chemistry, they don't really want to see curriculum development um, as part of the kind of the broader impact, all of that. Some of the programs are fine with that. And so a question I have for you is, did you go back and have a conversation with your NSF program officer? Because- I have not, but I just drafted that email to request a meeting, so thank oh, you. Yeah, definitely have that conversation because, you know, the thing is NSF program officers they cannot, they don't cross out any of the comments you get. And so some of the comments from the reviewers, you know, if you talk to the program officer, the program officer is going to say, oh, that's crazy. Do not do that. Uh, but you have to have that conversation to get that information. And maybe in your field, 
maybe that's something they want. And so the program officer can do that. That comment could have come from a new reviewer who the only thing they've been on is a panel for huge proposals that always have advisory boards. So they thought, well, you should have an advisory board. So I really don't, you know, talk with your program officer to find out where that's coming from. All right, we have um, the question, uh, two, two more questions, and then Angela has um, some, some final thoughts that she wants to share. Um, so, so back to the question from Michaela, what was the composition of the peer mentoring group? All assistant profs applying for NSF career or other senior profs? If the former, is there any competition among the attendees in similar areas, e.g. withholding information? Yeah, so the composition of our group was all assistant professors who were all applying for career and that made it really uh, The fact that we all had the same deadline and we were all at the same place in preparing the proposal was really helpful to like kind of keep us all on track. Uh, we did have some senior people come, you know, periodically to the meetings to you know, talk to them, um, people who had been on panels, you know, uh, to get this kind of advice from them. So we did do that like a couple times throughout the few months that we were meeting, but they would just come, you know, once we met with most of us were in biochemistry. So we actually met with the chair to talk about the chair letters. Um, so we we had some other input, but the actual core group who met every week was all people who were applying. Um, in terms of was there any competition, uh, that was not an issue for our group because of just the research areas that we were in. Um, the biochemistry department is extremely diverse in terms of research topics, so we don't really have we didn't really have that issue. So I can't really speak to like, what would be the best way to manage that if it was an issue. I would say if, if you really think that you can't share what's in the proposal with a certain group of people, that probably is not a group that you should work with. So if I would say going and you know, if you're in chemistry, getting together a group that includes like some people from biochemistry or, you know, math or somewhere else that kind of fits with you that you feel more comfortable sharing with, that's probably better than like having a group where you're like holding back details of the proposal. Um, I also like, I mean, my personal perspective, I'm in a very niche research area. So I've, I'm probably not the best person to speak on this, but I always kind of feel like, you know, if you should just be out there with like what you're doing and it's like way too stressful to try to like be like playing a game of competition. One of the other things, and again, maybe Angela can provide some more perspective on this, but things that I've heard about career and it seemed to be true when I was in the panel is that it is more about you as the investigator than an other type of NSF grant. And they do wanna see like your individuality and what you are uniquely bringing to science. So if it's a proposal that's like everybody in your field is racing to do that same thing and you're just gonna do it first, that might not be the best project for career anyway. Yeah, I agree with that. And actually, you know, through the years, I've seen a lot more successes of people who are trying to do almost like these writing circles or whatever, working together towards, you know, trying to hit the, the career mark. I mean, it's kind of motivational to be sitting down working with other folks with have the same deadline. And I think the big thing is just making sure that everyone has kind of their, uh, before you start meeting too much, already have kind of what you'd like to do in terms of your in terms of your uh, broader impacts piece, education piece, sort it out first, because that's the only area where I really would see that there would possibly be competition, because uh, you really want to have it be uniquely your own. Okay, we have a couple of more questions. Um, so this is from Antonio Castilla. 
Your BI activities focused on teaching skills to the audience, uh, for example, uh, uh, computational skills, be necessarily connected to the research project's main topic. Combining complex tools and topics can be overwhelming for not experienced audiences, and I find it tricky to get a balance here. I think that this is really a key issue that we are all facing, right? That um, if you take your research as a whole, that is totally complex and overwhelming for probably any other audience other than your immediate peers. Um, but maybe there are components in your research if you kind of just focus on, on some elements that that might be more um, easy, easier to, to relate to or to kind of have some uh, audiences be excited about it. So it doesn't have to be everything that you are studying, but maybe there's just one element. And I think Angela also gave a wonderful example to make it more relatable, uh, talking about food instead of whatever chemicals uh, it were. So maybe you can just um, yeah, try to be um, maybe creative with your, with your topic and just highlight one aspect that you think might resonate well with uh, just a general audience. Anyone else have a response for that question? Um, another question, uh, for any of the panelists, does your department have dedicated outreach staff who help with your broader impact work? If so, does that approach help? For me, no, I've, I've done my own outreach through, these, through the years. I still do my own outreach. I'm still active in the uh, event that, that we try to do. I try to do with a number of different organizations in, in Detroit for Detroit public schools every year. So, um, you know, I, I think it's part of, part of, part of the fun, so. Um, I would like to add that uh, there are a number of, uh, um, every college has uh, definitely a lot of initiatives which you can become a part of. So I think you should uh, find out from your college, you know, what the college is doing already, uh, because, you know, we find in engineering, there's so many programs going on same thing in NATSA and other places. So uh, you can connect with your calling offices to see what is already being done and then tap into that. I think what works about tapping into those programs is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. There, and, and your event can still be highly individual and unique to your particular research proposal and yourself and the, the motivations that you bring and it can still be literature based or you know science based in, in whatever way that means for your program or your project but it does allow you to leverage existing infrastructure to get a you know a, a, a wider reach or a different audience than you're used to considering another thing that i think can be powerful about using those existing frameworks maybe not for what you're proposing but if you want to propose something entirely new is that you can get a letter of support from one of those individuals who does work in outreach in your area. So in the College of Engineering, for example, that's my perspective. We have lots of outreach programs that we can use to either work, work with to design new outreach events or tap into those existing pro like camps or whatever is being happening already. And then if you get that letter of support, it really indicates that you have a relationship with those people and that your plan is sort of substantiated in that way. What's really key about that, though, is to be real careful because it, it's great to leverage what we have, but to make sure that you're adding a new dimension on top of that. Because I've seen some career proposals where people say, well, all they're doing is they're just participating in something that already exists. So you've got to make sure and make it very clear in terms of, yes, this already exists. This is the framework. This is the platform. And I will be adding this piece to it. And that's really important. This is a much smaller piece than um, what they were saying, but I, one thing that I will say is that um, even if you don't have dedicated outreach staff, which my department doesn't either, um, you can find ways to get help with some of the parts of it, of organization that are less 
uh, related to your research and get help from department staff in like scheduling things and sending emails and making orders and you know registering for things and stuff like that. And for me, that has been really helpful um, to kind of let other people who are better at those things do those tasks. And then I can focus more on the other parts of it. So we are at 12.01, which is one minute over the session. Laura and Shoba, um, this, is, this is your panel. Um, we yes, have one sir. more question and Angela did not get a chance to get to her um, final points. What would you like to do? Do you have a few more minutes, um, Angela? Would you be able to, to join us for a few more minutes? Sure, yes, to the 12 o'clock hour? Definitely. Um, if we could, care? yeah. If we could quickly answer the final session or the final question, and then Angela, if you don't mind spending a few minutes sharing um, the document that you would prepare, that would be wonderful. All right, so the final question is, uh, for career projects that are education-based, what are some recommendations for using broader impacts to reach out to faculty and practitioners to influence the way they approach the way they teach? My first proposal was a bit hard to write because it feels like the BI is inherent in the work I do. Any thoughts? I think that's fascinating. And as someone who is an educator, um, I mean, obviously, Professor Wright, but also through the K-12 outreach that I do, do I think that it, one thing that could be an opportunity is to organize some kind of a seminar that, or, or you know, a, a a Zoom recorded session that you record yourself that you could then share with faculty colleagues um, across MSU, or even if it's online, you could share it even more with an even broader reach. You could include the state of Michigan, other research universities in Michigan, or I don't know exactly what your educational objectives are for your proposal inherently, but I do know that there are a number of pedagogy type seminars or events that the College of Engineering provides for faculty and that people are often enthusiastic to attend and try to learn better ways to teach because teaching is one big part of our job. And so that might be something you could think about including. Um, I, I mean, if I don't know what your area is, but if you wanted to email me, I would be happy to share with you some, to brainstorm with you if, if maybe that would be helpful. Okay, any other um, responses to that question before we let Angela um, deliver her final points? Okay, Angela, the floor is yours. Okay, I just wanted to give a, a couple of points and just some advice for, um, for those of you who are pro providing NSF, uh, pursuing NSF career awards. Um, some of these things, don't worry, I'm not going to go through every single bullet into so much detail, but just a few things after looking at many, many, many NSF proposals through the years. First of all, you've already heard from a couple of the panelists that they have been on NSF panels. So my suggestion to you is that when we get done today, that you look up who your program officer might be. Uh, if you're in multidisciplinary areas, just pick one and email and volunteer your service on an NSF panel. It makes a world of difference in terms of writing a panel, uh, writing a proposal. It doesn't have to be a career, uh, career panel. It can be on any panel, just offer your service. The second part is make sure that you have 10 products. I've seen people try to put uh, career proposals together that have six publications, not 10. You really wanna to try to hit that 10 uh, before you submit, that's really important. I think when you frame this, make sure that you have several possible projects in mind that include long, medium, and near-term goals. I think that's really important to uh, towards success on most, uh, NS most NSF career proposals, at least the ones I've seen in chemistry, biology, and physics. Um, make sure you read the pro program uh, announcement very thoroughly. Read about the division and the research that is supported within the division. And then I suggest that several months prior now is a good time or, or even the next month to contact a program officer and have a conversation with them. 
have a conversation. Don't waste time asking questions that are already in the proposal. Talk about a couple of different research options that you're thinking about, but then also have a conversation about some of what you're thinking about in terms of the education component as well. They may be able to give you some, you know, they're, they're not gonna tell you, yes, yes, definitely do that. But sometimes if you're really listening, they will provide you with enough hints that you can kind of get the gist of what, what might be of most interest to them and areas that maybe you shouldn't be thinking about or some additional aspects you maybe should be thinking about. Um, put together a strong research description. That is really important. And do get feedback, however you want to do it, whether it's with peers, with some trusted faculty in your departments who've had career awards before, that is absolutely critical. Look at the prior career award descriptions in the NSF uh, data base. That's really important. You get some ideas for broader impacts. I've already mentioned a proposal will not be funded because of broader impacts um, alone, um, but if you have a weak broader impact section, that can definitely sink your proposal. So that's really important. We've already talked about the synergy. We've talked about educational activities and the importance of digging into literature, but has been mentioned, it only takes, it doesn't take much time at all. Um, the NSF program announcements provide a list of ideas for education activities. Be creative, you know, take that list, but don't be afraid to kind of go beyond that as well. Um, uh, you know, make sure that you include, I really suggest doing a scaffolding, do a number of different broader impacts. Pick something you'd enjoy doing, not just your research team, as I've said. Most divisions programs do not look favorably upon curriculum development, despite what is said on the calls. So just be really careful about that. Don't, I wouldn't suggest that ever being just the full component of what you do. It can be a part of the component, but not all of it. You heard some examples in terms of career proposals, multiple career pro proposals that were funded the first time, and that was these folks working together. I think that's really helpful. In general, most career proposals are not funded the first time. That's fine. Learn from that experience. Put a strong forward proposal forward. Get the feedback. This is always important when you get a proposal. When you get the reviews, relish the positive comments. Be ready for criticism rather than defend it or argue about it. After about one to two weeks, go back, cross out the positive comments, focus on the negative comments in terms of how you can address them next time. Reach out to the program officer and make sure you have a conversation with the program officer within about a month, no sooner than two weeks, but within about a month of getting back your reviews. Just email them and don't even try to argue with them. They're not going to reverse the decision. Approach them with, hey, I really want to figure out what I can do better. Do you have any other advice? I see the proposals. I see some things I can address, and I really would appreciate your, your feedback. If you don't argue with them and you show that you're really willing to listen, I tell you what, you're going to have an ally for the future, and that's really important for NSF. And so I just wanted to finish with that, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Um, all the panel, I really thank you for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.